Welcome to Profits to Wealth. This is your host, Jack Marino Jr. Today on the show, I'll be interviewing mortgage broker Eddie Fushang. You may know the destination, but do you know the path to take you there? This is Profits to Wealth. We shorten the time it takes for entrepreneurs to find true success through guided conversations alongside industry elites. We'll cover your commonly asked questions and dive into the skills, tactics, and lessons learned from business professionals who've turned the industry on its head through experience, critical thinking, as well as practical money management. It's time to talk business, money, and freedom with your host, Jack Marino Jr. Eddie is the founder of the Eddie Fushang Mortgage Team in Austin, Texas. He and his team passionately educate clients on the home buying process and assist them with securing the right mortgage to make their home ownership dream come true. Eddie, thank you so much for uh, being a guest on Profits to Wealth today. I'm, I'm excited to hear from you being that you are in the mortgage market and with the COVID-19 uh, virus, you know, starting to to spread everywhere. It's, it's really changed everything. So, there's opportunities out there and, uh, you know, some aspects of the economy are changing for the good, for the bad, but I'm just anxious to hear from you today. Well, I appreciate you inviting me to be a uh, part of this show, Jack. Uh, by all means, it's definitely a turbulent time that we're in and it's very volatile and uh, changes are happening by the minute as we speak. So, I think it's definitely a very beneficial conversation to have right now, especially with everybody who is entertaining the idea of uh, buying a home or maybe refinancing their existing home. Absolutely. Because, you know, with any kind of turbulent time, it's not all doom and gloom. There there are opportunities. And that's what I try to get Absolutely. people to focus on is don't, in times of turbulence, don't, don't keep your head down. Look up. Look up for their opportunities. Obviously, you need to be vigilant and protecting uh, your family and your assets during this time, but there's just a ton of opportunity if you have the right mindset. So let's kick it off with, you know, just talking more about you and your team. So you're the founder of Eddie Fushang Mortgage Team here in the Austin, Texas area. Uh, tell me more about Correct. your business. So we are a full house uh, mortgage uh, office. I have a team of four uh, solid, strong, experienced members who focus on one thing and one thing only, which is to help as many people as we possibly can become homeowners, number one, and obviously provide them with the best service possible. And uh, really the foundation of my business was built on education because I literally was a consumer myself trying to buy a home years back and not knowing what I was doing and felt like there was definitely a need for someone to educate the public on what's needed to qualify for a home loan. And that was really my driving uh, force and passion to get into the business. And I took the experience I learned on my own to become a homeowner, and I basically applied it in my uh, my practice. And everybody I brought on board uh, to be a m- member of my team had to have that core quality in them. So everybody you know, on my team, we are 100% committed to education, number one. Number two, to obviously provide the best service and uh, value to our consumers and partners. Awesome. Now, yeah. As far as the loan products we have, Jack, very much anything residential is something that we are able to do. Okay. Uh, so we do have the traditional financing, the conventional, the FHAs, the VAs, the USDAs, which everybody has offer access to. We also have the non-traditional financing available as well for people who do not necessarily meet the traditional route, meaning maybe self-employed who does not have enough money showing up on their tax return because of, uh, you know, the business expenses or losses or whatever, we have the bank statements routes and stuff like that. Now, keep in mind, at the time that we are recording this conversation, there is definitely changes happening in the market as we speak due to the COVID-19 situation that we're in right now. But nonetheless, this is just a general view of what we're able to offer. Okay. So refinance, new home purchase, do you do any home equity line of credits or reverse mortgages or anything like that? I personally do not do reverse mortgages. I usually have uh, professional partners who specialize in that because you definitely need to have some sort of uh, specialty to be able to uh, do reverse mortgages. And frankly, with the uh, the speed of my operation and the number of uh, loans we're doing, I personally do not have the bandwidth to sit down and uh, 
specialize in it because it's very time consuming. However, I do have partners who that's all they do. Okay. And that's their uh, specialty. So we can definitely forward uh, people to those professionals who specialize in that. Uh, same thing with the home equity line of credit. Uh, the, what we do is we do ec- you know home equity loans, and that's different from home equity line of credit. Okay. Uh, equity loans are basically considered to be a regular mortgage loan where we use the equity in the home to be able to provide the cash out to the consumer who's looking to either get the money to pay off some debt or take it and buy investment properties with it or just take it for whatever cash purposes they need it for, right? The difference between a home equity line of credit and a regular cash out refinance is like I said, a uh, cash out refinance is a first mortgage transaction, meaning it's gonna qualify for all the benefits of what a mortgage does for a consumer, the tax write-offs and, and, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, yeah tax write-off for the interest write-offs and all that stuff. And again, CPAs will be able to answer these questions for them. Where a home economic credit act like a credit card. You're basically taking equity out of your home, but using it as a line of credit, kind of like a credit card will. You have availability for that money. You use it whenever you want to, and you just pay it off whenever you use it. So that's the difference between them. So they're not considered really a mortgage loan. So um, the rates are going to be differentiating. So on a home equity line of credit, rates typically are higher than a regular mortgage financing, usually about one and a half, two points higher in the rates. Okay. So no home equity line of credit, but you can do cash out refinance. Right. Correct. Yeah. Home equity line of credit, I would say probably the best options for those are going to be the local credit unions. They usually dominate in that market. Okay. And... If uh, someone was interested in the cash out refinance, there's a little bit of adjustment in the rate for those, correct? Correct. Okay. But in the event yeah. somebody really needed some money, that little small adjustment is, is minor. That is correct. Okay. I would probably say, like, for example, a traditional rate and term refinance uh, or a per, you know, first time or a first lien mortgage, right now they're probably going to be somewhere in the high threes maybe low fours, where on a cash out refinance, they could be approaching the high fours, maybe low fives. Okay. So it's about a one to one and a half percent difference uh, in price. Okay. So, you know, maybe it's still an option. You can explore the other home equity loans, home equity line of credit options. And if that doesn't, you know, work for you, you can just do a cash out refinance. Is there... um, Yeah. Any, from a client standpoint, I mean, do you focus on business owners or do you pretty much help anyone that needs a mortgage? Anybody who needs a mortgage uh, uh, is, is one, is my client. Okay. For okay. Sure. Yeah. Well, as you've already stated, you know, this is, uh, you know, March 27th, 2020, we're, we're in the middle of a COVID-19 world changing event. The outbreak of this virus is changing a lot of things. And the mortgage business, the mortgage lending business has changed a lot. It changed in 08. It changed after 08. It's changing now. So what what changes have happened just in the last three to four weeks? Well, it's changing actually by the minute. So I, I guess a better question, what, 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 what changes happened in the last 15 minutes? <laughs> Unfortunately, with this volatile market that we're in right now, Uh, What you are going to be experiencing, and I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible because it's a very complex conversation and details to go over. But as you can see, there is a very high number of unemployment going on right now that's causing people to obviously not be able to qualify for the home loans anymore. And not only that, you also have a situation where lenders are starting to prepare themselves in case. Due to that mass layoff, they will start seeing default on mortgages. So everybody's basically playing defensive right now, Jack. So what's going on right now, there are definitely going to be a little bit more stricter in the guidelines just due to the fact that uh, lenders are trying to hold onto their cash as, as, as much as possible. So lending the money is not as aggressive as it used to be because they want to make sure that they have the assets and the cash flow in case there is going to be a mass default on mortgages coming up soon. Two, you also have the uh, servicers who are supposed to be making their money based on the interest rate that the borrower is paying every single month. And typically speaking, they usually make their money after, they they have to have the loan for at least three years Mm -hmm. to be able to make their profit on the loan. Otherwise, they're losing money. So for example, let's say someone who did a purchase a year ago, and because of the uh, 
assumed nature that people think right now that uh, because the Fed's dropped the Federal Reserve rates to 0%, which is obviously a big misinformation going on out there, that they think mortgage rates are at 0%, which obviously that's not true. So it caused a lot of people to apply to refinance their home loans. So essentially what's happening here, all the loans that were produced in the last three years, people trying to get out of it to refinance it. So those servicers have not made their money yet on those loans. So because of that mass refinance boom that's happening right now, that's causing mortgage companies to actually raise the interest rates a bit to kind of number one, slow it down, slow that demand down because you don't have the manpower to work on all these loans. Number two, they're trying to obviously maintain balance so that way at least those servicers are not going out of business tomorrow. Because again, if they do not keep the home loan for at least like let's say three years or so, it's usually the average, they do not make money. So they're actually losing money. Does that make sense? Yes, so it does. So all of that happening, plus, you know, for the purchase for the purchase world, we've seen it where people are already qualified and they're ready to close and they're under contract. And I actually had one family who was supposed to close tomorrow. And unfortunately, they got the news on Tuesday that they got laid off. And unfortunately, once you're laid off, the loan cannot proceed anymore. So you have that in the mix as well. It's causing a lot of frustration and a lot of confusion in the marketplace and uh, the defense mechanism that usually goes mortgage companies and investors have is let's slow it down. Let's tighten the guidelines a little bit. Let's slow down the, the new purchase or the new, uh, uh, new loan production to, in a way, kind of manage that change as it happens. And it's happening, like I said, it's a very fluid situation. It's changing by the minute. So I know I dumped up a lot of information on you, but I want to make sure that I kind of like give a grand uh, view of what's happening in the market right now. Yeah, the short of it is, if I heard you right, is that some of the more lenient programs are going away, at least for right now, to protect the banks or the lenders in times of uh, massive layoffs. Um, so that that's, if I heard you correctly there. And uh, a lot of these banks or lenders like yourself are inundated with people refinancing or wanting to purchase. And that's kind of Correct. clogged up the system. So to mitigate that, lenders are uh, increasing the rates a little bit to kind of slow it down. Well, that's in a, in a simplistic view of the situation, right? I mean, there's definitely a lot more complex than that, but this is just a simple overview of what's happening. Now, don't get me wrong. This is going to generate a huge opportunity pool for those who are wanting to buy houses at the right time because we've experienced the hottest real estate market in the past three years, right? And it was a seller's market. And I, I consider... The seller's market is probably going to be starting to die down in the next maybe few weeks, maybe a couple of months. And what's going to happen is going to shift. The pyramid is going to flip. It will become a buyer's market. Let me explain what that means. Up until maybe a couple of weeks ago, for every one house that was available for sale, there was usually four to five buyers wanting to buy that house. And that was causing bidding wars between the buyers on who's going to win the bid on buying the house, right? So for example, let's say the house was listed for sale for 200,000, and then you had five buyers outbidding each other to win the house, and you end up selling the house for, let's say, 230,000 instead of 200,000, right? That was causing the, obviously, the home values to go up, and it was making the real estate market extremely hot. What most likely will happen is you have all these people seeing the news about what the COVID-19 is causing and the mass layoffs and all these things, or some of those homeowners, unfortunately, probably lost their jobs or are going to lose their jobs, and they're not going to be able to afford the mortgage. So they want to sell the house as soon as possible before for the, market, the market turns on them. So what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing a lot of houses going out on the market for sale. So instead of now having for every one house four buyers, it's going to be the opposite. For every one buyer, you're going to find maybe three or four houses for sale. And that shifts the market to make it a buyer's market, no longer a seller's market. So what used to happen where buyers would outbid each other to win the house, now you have the homeowners on the same street competing with each other for that one buyer. And that usually causes the prices to maybe decline a bit or maybe remain the same. Does that make sense? It does. And I would think that that depends on the area because it does at least as we speak today on March 27th, I think that 
the most severely impacted have been probably the lower end of the market. And uh, there's a lot, and specifically in Austin, there's a lot of high tech and even healthcare. And, uh, you know, we have the ability, most companies now have the ability to work remotely. And as we record this, there hasn't been a whole lot of direct impact there yet. But I understand what you're saying is the dynamic sure. can change and it and it does it doesn't mean that it's a across the board buyers exactly. market. Now, this is gonna be just an overview in the market, not necessarily the Austin, Texas market. Sure. We're talking about the market as yeah. a whole. And just remember the mortgage companies are not tied to one geographical location. They're doing business all over either the state or all over the country. So whatever is happening outside of the Austin, Texas Metroplex is still affecting them, whether you know it's changing here or not, over the grand view of things, it's changing them overall. Does that make sense? Yes. But again, nonetheless, it's going to be a great opportunity for those who have been waiting for the right time to purchase. This is it. This is right now. You need to get ready. You need to get pre-approved. You need to get your financing in order and in line. So once you start seeing opportunities coming your way, which is going to be coming very soon, you're already financially ready to make offers and buy the houses and, and, and get the best deal possible. I agree with you. Before we get into the purchase side, I'm just curious because I would think that there's, and you mentioned it, a lot of demand for refinancing. Rates have dropped. What advice would you give listeners who are wanting to refinance? Maybe they're happy where they live and they just want to take advantage of a lower rate. The first thing I would say is just get an idea of what's available right now in the market. Because like I said, what maybe was offered to you a week ago, two weeks ago, does not exist as of today, right? Or Sometimes is what was offered to you literally five minutes ago does not exist. The, the market is extremely volatile, which we've never seen it before like that. We used to maybe check the rate sheet maybe once a day. Now we're, change, we're looking at it literally nonstop. It's on our screen. Every loan officer who's in the business right now literally has the MBS, which is the mortgage-backed security trading uh, chart on their screen because it's literally changing by the minute. So what I would say if you are interested to kind of see if, if right now makes a good sense for you to refinance, all you will need to do is just basically contact the loan officer. Obviously, I would love to do it for you, and I'll give the contact information at the end, where you would just need to provide maybe some information about the loan that you currently have right now, what is the interest rate you have right now, how many years you have left on the mortgage right now, and then we will be able to tell you what type of pricing we're seeing that day. And if it makes sense and it looks like it's going to be financially beneficial, then we'll basically proceed with the application and, and, and proceed with the refinance process. But if for any reason it does not make any sense, we usually inform our clients and let them know right now I don't see a benefit, but mm-hmm. let's just go ahead and hold tight and watch the market and see what happens. And then we can revisit it in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what, so what considerations or type of analysis do you and your team make when refinancing, helping somebody with the refinance process? Because there is what we call a break-even analysis. Um, you know, obviously refinances to refinance your mortgage, it does have a cost. So how, how do you uh, help mm-hmm. folks out with so, that? First question we usually ask is what's the goal of the refinance? There is typically usually two reasons why people want to refinance a home loan, right? These are the two common ones. Either they want to access equity in their home to use it to either buy another investment property or pay off some debt or for whatever reason, maybe you do some home remodeling at a, at a pool in the backyard, whatever the reason is, right? So it's usually a cash out refinance or somebody wants to either reduce the term under, let's say they have a 30 year loan and they have 24 years left on uh, the mortgage, and maybe they want to shorten it to 15 years, right? So we call that term reduction refinance. Or they just looking to lower the interest rate, maybe keep the same term, just lower the interest rate to save on the monthly payment every month, okay? So depending on the goal of the refinance, that's usually determined how the analysis works. So for example, let's say somebody just wants to do a rate and term refinance. And they have a 30-year loan, but they already paid seven years on it, so they have 23 years left. And let's say the interest rate was 3.75% when they bought it or 4% when they bought it. And right now, the best I can offer them, let's say, 3.5% interest rate, and it's going to reduce the monthly payment by $50 a month. But let's say that the cost of the loan, the closing cost for the lender is going to be, let's say, and the title company and the third parties, let's say it's about $3,000. So in this situation, what I do is I take the $3,000 for the cost of the loan. 
and then divide it over like the monthly savings that we'll be saving them, $50 a month. That will be 60 months. That's basically five years for them to make their money back. Okay. So the question here is, do you plan to keep this home or stay in this home for at least the next five years? Or do you have the intention at some point, probably within the next couple of years to sell it or maybe uh, refinance the loan again and go somewhere else? So depending on that answer, that's when we will determine if that makes sense or not. If it does not make any sense financially, we will just say, personally, we don't see a financial sense of this, but it's they're the captain of the ship. They will make that decision. So in my book, I would like to see at least no more than three years to mm-hmm. recoup your money back. Okay. If it's going to take more than three years to recoup the money back, personally, I just don't think it's a wise move unless yeah. they're planning to be in it for the next 30 years. Yeah, because you know I mean? yeah, regardless of you, if you roll in the cost or you pay it out of pocket, it still has a cost. And Correct. that's a that's a great point. When I said break even analysis, that's exactly what I was referring to because if you refinance and then twelve months later leave, you're worse off than you Correct. were. You should have kept the old rate. So uh, I know now, that if you keep it if you keep it for the life of the loan with the new rate, then oh, it yeah. will be very beneficial because you will save off the interest over the life of the loan. But if you just keep the new loan for a very short period of time, I say anything less than three years then at that point, it may not become a wise move. Right. Yeah. So I agree with you as a financial advisor. I have just like you do probably a bunch of spreadsheets and I run uh, cash flow. And then I also look at uh, various periods of time over the next one to six years and look at what's the balance of the loan at the end of this and try to see if they're in a better position or not. So yeah, I think you definitely have to do some type of break-even analysis before you can decide, which I know you're doing, if that's a good move or not. But I know there's a lot of people that should be doing this refinance um, because the average, I think the last time I saw was a homeowner stays in their, in their home maybe five to seven years. So for a lot of people, there's probably enough of a savings there to go ahead and do it, especially as we speak. We're may be in a recession at this point. So maybe people are going to stay a little longer at this point, but uh, it definitely should be done. The analysis should be done there. All right. So let's say I'm interested in the refinance or purchase. How can I expedite this process? Because it sounds like everyone's extremely busy and let's, I want to make this uh, process as smooth as possible because the faster I get you everything, the faster I can lock, lock in a rate. So how do you, um, it's really that that. simple with us. We're believers in the high tech movement. And we believe that the less you have to basically get on the phone with someone and maybe uh, do the um, back and forth, leaving messages for each other to call, you know, I just feel it's, it's not very time efficient. So my recommendation, it's always to be very efficient as possible. So what I would recommend people to do is to visit my application site. It's very simple application, just spelled out, dot team Fushang, my last name, F as in Frank, O-O-S-H-A-N as in Nancy, G as in George. So application dot team com. That will take you straight to my online application and it allows you to upload all your income documents that is requested from you. So by the time you complete it, it notifies not only me, it notifies me and my team members that we have a brand new applicant in the system waiting for us. And once we open up the file, we very, pretty much already have the, uh, the application ready for us to process right away and uh, pre-approve it. And then we have the income documents already saved in the system. So it just makes it very quick for us to be able to give you an answer and the pre-approval, whether it's a purchase or refinance, in a very efficient and very quick time, timely fashion. What's the time frame? We're talking about if we, if we get the application, we you will have an answer the same day. Unless really? it's obviously coming to us in the evening, it will be the following day. Okay. So if I submit all my application and documents online, uh-huh. the same day, assuming it's early enough in the day, you'll have a, a pre-approval? Yeah, you have a pre-approval or you have at least some sort of a result from that in the same day. So okay. I, I usually say if, as long as we get the application by 2 o'clock of that day, we'll have an answer the same day. Uh, if not, depending on how busy we are, it might be the following day. But it's usually 24 hours turnaround time okay. for the answer. Well, that's that's faster than I thought. So we've been talking about both refinance and new home purchases. Are you still, I, I would assume that there's more 
refinance applicants than there are new home purchases. But you tell me, is there a lot of demand for new home purchases right now? Yeah, the new home purchase is not going to slow down, especially here in the Austin area for, you know, even though with what's going on right now, there is still going to be a really high demand on purchases, especially actually going forward. There's definitely going to be people wanting to take advantage of good opportunities and there's definitely going to be good opportunities coming up. So I would say right now there's still probably uh, a 50-50 balance between the two. We are definitely seeing a mass increase. The only thing I can tell you right now, the mass increase of refinances, usually after we have the analysis conversation with the borrower, we usually determine that maybe it's not the right time to do it. If they are the right time, obviously we'll proceed with it. But a lot of these desires are coming from misinformation because of the Federal Reserve reduction in the uh, Federal Reserve rates to 0% about a week ago caused a lot of uh, confusion, number one, in the market, and people thought that they were going to be getting a 0% mortgage, which does not exist, (laughs) right? What they did was just reduce the rate that bank can borrow money from the federal government and from each other, right? So that's what that 0% means. It does not have any direct relationship to mortgage interest rates. If you don't uh, mind, if I can interject there. So we typically look at the 10-year treasury. Is that what you would tell most people? It's not a one-for-one, obviously, but is that a good benchmark to kind of look at? That is a good benchmark, yes. So that there's a lot of uh, phone calls immediately after that news hit the mainstream, but it really died down, I would say, the past four or five days, it was not as aggressive as it was a week ago. So just me, more traditional right now, people just wanted to kind of get an idea, hey, is this a good time for us to refinance or not? And that's, these are the phone calls we obviously, we encourage and we welcome. If you're not sure if this is a good time or not, just go ahead and call and ask. And it doesn't have to obviously be me. Anybody who you know in the mortgage business that you have a relationship with can absolutely answer that question for you. Obviously, we would love to be the voice here and help answer those phone calls and uh, provide quotes. But nonetheless, if you are not 100% sure, I would highly recommend pick up the phone and just call someone and, and they will tell you if it is a good time or not. Yeah, I agree. Talk to a professional. The online, in my opinion, I mean, some people have gone to the online lending sources and I'm not knocking anyone's business, but I can tell you, especially in times like this, you need someone to walk you through this and help you with these analysis to make sure that you're in the right product. If you're refinancing, it makes sense. This is a big decision. You need somebody with experience. Exactly. And just to keep in mind, sometimes those online rates that people usually see, these are what we call the base rates for the lender. They're not going to obviously lend the money based on what they receive the money for. So it's as if I am buying a car for $4,000 and I'm listing how much my cost is for the car. And then people are expecting me to sell it for the $4,000. Well, I'm a business. I'm trying to make a profit. I'm not going to be able to sell it for $4,000 if I'm buying it for $4,000. So a lot of times what's happening is people are looking at the base rates of the lenders online and they assume that that's the rate they're able to get. That's not necessarily true because they're still going to be, the lender is not going to be able to obviously give you the rate that they're getting the money for. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yes, it does. So this show is Profits to Wealth is uh, for, you know, our listeners are business owners, entrepreneurs. And so let's talk about the current home purchase process because I know there's entrepreneurs out there that have a healthy business right now that want to purchase a house. What does the process look like for entrepreneurs? Because we all, you know, our income tax return is different. There can be, as you mentioned early in the show, we can have a lot of expenses that we can write off, which reduce our taxable income, which depending on what the size of that taxable income is, can penalize you from a home purchase standpoint. So how does the process look like for us business owners and entrepreneurs? And maybe are there any different type of products out there for the home purchase? Yeah. So the, the home purchase process is the same, whether you're an you know, entrepreneur, self-employed or a regular W-2 employee. It's the same process. Basically, the application, you need to pull up, obviously, a credit report to determine what liabilities you currently have 
right now on top of the credit score. Two, we would need to get income documentations to verify the income calculation is correct that's on the application. And then obviously, once we gather all this information, we're able to determine what is the approval amount this borrower qualifies, depending on how much money they're planning to put as a down payment and such. Once we figure out what the purchase price amount is, we issue something called a pre-approval letter. The pre-approval basically says that the lender has taken an application from the borrower reviewed the credit report, reviewed the liabilities, reviewed the income, reviewed the assets, reviewed this, reviewed the score. And based on this information, we are confident that this loan will get approved as long as it does not exceed this dollar amount, right? So that way you are now able to go look for houses that are in that price range. Okay. Once you find a home that is ideal and you make an offer and let's say the offer was accepted by the seller, then both parties will enter into something called executed contract, meaning buyer and the seller both signed on the dotted line that they both agree to these terms. Once we have that executed contract, it comes to us and then we end up doing something called locking the interest rate for the borrower. That way we can protect it and ensure that the pricing will be fixed. It's, it's always a 30-year fixed loan, but the rate itself will not change with the markets until they close on the loan. That's what the lot does. Okay. okay. And then once we obviously submit the file to underwriting, order the appraisal, and the underwriter provides the actual clear to close, which is the final approval, then the buyer is able to go to the title company, sign the paperwork, receive the home keys, and voila. It's a homeowner, right? So this whole process, it takes usually on average between three to four weeks as far as closing, closing time from the day of the contract, the executed contract to the closing date. It usually takes about three to four weeks. Right now, in the times that we're in right now, because of the some of the title companies work reduction, some of the mortgage companies work reduction and stuff like that, it may take maybe an additional week longer to, to close it. But nonetheless, we have not seen it really prolong over four weeks at this point. So that's the process in grand view. Now, the documents that we need for a specifically self-employed individual or an entrepreneur, there is two ways that we can go about it, right? You have two types of self-employed people. You have corporate owners who mm-hmm. owns corporations, and then maybe they pay themselves a W-2 or such. In this situation, that individual is going to have two tax returns every year. He has a personal 1040, and then you have the corporate 1120, right? Mm -hmm. In these situations, we will need to receive both for the last two years. So it's going to be basically four tax returns that we would receive as a lender. What if we don't have two years? Is that a problem? So let's say, for example, you do not file the 2019 yet because you have an extension. We would need 18 and 17. If you don't have 18 as well, then we would need 17 and 16. There's going to be always a two-year tax return that we would have to. Well, what if they started in, uh, let's say, this year and they have a 19 tax return? Then in that situation, yeah, in that situation, they would have to wait until they've had the business for at least two years. It's a minimum requirement. Okay. You have to have experience in the business for at least two years. Now, you may not need to own the business for the last two years if it's coming from the same line of work. For example, let's say you were a roofer. And but you work for a roofing company and you're 1099, you're a subcontractor working mm-hmm. for a bigger company. But then now you started your own business as a roofing company. The fact that you've had two years in the same line of work and you are still considered self-employed, that's acceptable. We can work with that. The what we cannot work with is if you are a W-2 employee and then you just literally became a self-employed individual within the last year or so. That's not allowed. We have to show at least two years experience as being self-employed for us to be able to do a loan for you. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, sir. It does. What about, you know, how can these entrepreneurs prepare for the new home purchase? So, I mean, obviously they need to gather documents, but let's say if I don't, uh, if I need the two years is, can I expedite? I guess I should ex- start expediting that process with my CPA tax preparer company Correct. And, and get that yeah, done. And, and there's definitely going to be a conversation they will need to have with the CPA. And here's the, here's where it became, becomes really very tricky because it's a double edged sword, right? I know some self-employed people want to obviously claim everything under the sun to uh, minimize their tax exposure. But unfortunately that does not help you when you're trying to buy a home because you're basically not showing any income. So So this is going to be a conversation that they would have to have with the CPA and just let them know my plan is to be buying a home and the CPA should be able to give you the right recommendations on how those taxes should be filed. Okay. There's another solution out there. It might take just a little longer. I'm sorry, not not longer, but it might might be on, on hold temporarily for the time being, but it's definitely available in the market. There is something called a bank statement program for uh, it's non-traditional financing where they use the business bank statements for the last 12 months 
and they take the deposits and average them over 12 months and they use that as the income. Now, you're going to obviously be paying a much higher interest rate because they're non-traditional financing and they're provided by private investors. So those loans typically are in the maybe mid sevens, maybe low 8% range Mm -hmm. compared to a high three, maybe low 4% range. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a vehicle as well available for someone who for the past two years did not claim any income or showed a lot of losses and we're not going to be able to use the tax return to qualify. Well, I guess they can work with their CPA and obviously that's a good point and tell them they're going to re, you know, be buying a house so they could uh, potentially not deduct some expenses to make the net income higher and they could uh, even potentially refile a tax return that had already been previously filed. Of course, they need to get with their tax advisor on that. I'm not a uh, CPA or a tax advisor, so it's I just, can't, can't recommend cannot, that. But be, what's that? Yeah, we cannot recommend anybody to do anything. What I can say is you, just, you, know, th- you have to speak with the CPA, but just so you understand, if for any reason the tax return was amended and it's specifically recently before the purchase, the underwriters of the lender will obviously look at that as a red flag. Like why did you amend the tax return immediately before the purchase of the home, right? So that can obviously be looked at negatively by an underwriter. Does that make sense? Yes. So you're recommending that they get with the CPA on that, but from a lender, that is a red flag. Is it, is it a no go or is it just, is going to go under scrutiny. No, no, it's, it's, there's, there's no, as long as they get like a written, in, in, you know, explanation from the CPA of why that change happened and the CPA is the one who's actually prepared it, then usually they are okay with that as long as there is a valid explanation of why the already filed return was amended or changed. Okay. And as far as, uh, uh, as long as we're in the preparing question here, what about anything else? I mean, what are you usually recommending on cash? Because we got to put some money down, plus have some reserves. I mean, how are you telling people that maybe want to buy in the next six to twelve months to prepare? So, if they're if self-employed or entrepreneur individual who it doesn't really have to be self-employed or entrepreneur, anybody in general who is looking to purchase a primary residence, meaning the home that they're going to be living in, and this is uh, verified that this is going to be their primary residence, the minimum down payment required really is three and a half percent if you're doing an FHA or 5% if we're doing a conventional loan, right? If you're trying to buy it as an investment property, you already have your own home and you're trying to buy an additional property to use it as a rental property, then in that situation, the minimum down payment is 15%. That's the absolute minimum. Plus, if you're doing it an investment property, you have to make sure that you can show that you have two months cash reserves for each property you own. And since you're on that topic on investment property, how long, let's say I bought one and I turned it into investment property, does it have to be rented for a certain amount of time before I count that income? So if you're buying an investment property, you can use 75% of the projected rental income that you're going to be receiving on it. Immediately. Right? But you would have to show immediately, as long as you have a lease agreement from someone, okay. from, from a tenant who's who signed a 12 months lease with you and already paid you the first month rent and, and stuff like that. And okay. we're able to verify it. You can use 75% of that income right away. But if it's a home that you you already have a couple of rental properties, you, we can use the rental income that is reported on the tax return. If it's not on the tax return, then we cannot use it. Can you cross collateralize if I have multiple properties and some have equity? No. Every, yeah. every property is individually for the, uh, I'm sorry, every loan is individually for the property that's on the loan for gotcha. the subject property. Okay. So as far as like using equities in what terms, as far as like cash reserves or such? Well, I'm just saying no, if I have liquid. one property has only 50%, I have 50% equity in one property, can I use some of that equity as my equity in the new loan? No. Okay. No. Okay. Because I know in the commercial market, you can do it. I'm just curious on the residential side. No, not, not on a residential side. No. Okay. You cannot use the equity from other property to, for the other one. No. Okay. All right. So in whether it's investment property or your primary residence, obviously you're going to need to save for down payment. We need Correct. to have some cash reserves on hand as well. So that's something else to consider if you're preparing for a home purchase. Correct. What about products? So we've got fixed rate, 30 year, 15, and we have arms or adjustable rate mortgages. How do you help clients with those uh, different product selections? Which one's best for them? I 
I never recommend an adjustable rate mortgage, period. I just personally do not, unless there is an exception to it. If you are an investor buying a house and have the intention to probably sell it in a year from now, then it might make sense for you to do maybe a two-year arm adjustable rate mortgage mm-hmm. because it's locked for the first two years. If you already know for a fact you're going to be selling the house like a year later or maybe two years later, within the next two years, okay? Mm-hmm. In that situation, an arm would not be a bad idea because usually they offer a lower interest rate than a fixed loan, right? So you can have an immediate cash flow for the first two years. Me personally, I just personally do not like the adjustable rate mortgages because what if you stay in the house or keep the house for the next two years and the market takes a massive change and now the monthly payment is higher, then it obviously becomes a problem. So that's really the answer to it. Now, as far as the 30-year fix, whether to go a 30-year or a 15-year, it's going to really depend on the cash flow of the borrower and depend on the situation and the goal. If somebody wants to, you know, definitely approaching retirement soon and wants to not have a mortgage by the time they retire and they're financially able to do it, then obviously it would be a very good good opportunity to do it because you're going to save also thousands of dollars on interest. But if cash flow is an issue and uh, the borrower is having a hard time maybe saving money and does not show an experience of saving money, then obviously 30 year would be the way to go because otherwise they would be very uh, strapped financially. Yeah. The 30 year gives so, you flexibility. And as you, you know, you can pay the 30 year obviously faster and reduce your interest. Correct. So you, exactly. you have that so ability. You, you can't go backwards. If you get a 15, you can't say, Hey, can I pay a 30? They're going to say, no, pay the the minimum payment. That's right. Yeah. So that does give you flexibility. You have flexibility if you do it on a 30 and you can still pay it off in 15 years by paying the 15 year payment Yeah. every month. Right. Right. So, but at least God forbid something happened in in your financial life and and maybe you just need a couple of months where maybe expenses need to be reduced a little bit. At least you have that flexibility with a 30 year loan. Right. And on the adjustable rate mortgages, they can make sense. Um, you know, you, you threw out some scenarios where if they're going to keep the house short term, because a lot of those arms or adjustable rate mortgages are five, seven year. So, you know, it depends on their, their, how well capitalized they are too, because some cases they could pay cash for it, but they can take advantage of a very low adjustable rate mortgage. And then as it, adju- if it adjusts up, right? Then they can uh, just pay the house off if they want to. But I agree with you. For most people, they probably should just select a uh, 30-year mortgage. But you know, everyone's situation is different. So that's why we have Correct. different products because it might, might make sense in different circumstances. Depends on the situation, depends on the goal, depends on the borrower. That's usually a conversation we have depending on the situation. So like you said, and there are two year arms or three years arms, there's five years or seven years. The highest I've seen is seven years. So mm-hmm. usually there are available. Obviously the higher the fixed period, the higher the interest rate is going to be. Sure. Makes sense. So have you ever recommended somebody just not purchase? even if they they qualified? Oh, yeah. We've actually had that conversation a few times. So not because you qualify for a purchase, it doesn't mean it's a good idea for you to purchase. I'll give you an example. A lot of homeowners, first-time homeowners, have no idea about the additional expenses that a homeowner will go through. Like, for example, property taxes, home insurance. Then you also have like the maintenance. What if the AC goes out? How much is that going to cost? And let's say it's out of the... uh, the warranty period. Well, what happens if the fridge stopped working? The microwave stopped working. So when you're a renter, the landlord is responsible for all these expenses. You're not responsible for it. But as a homeowner, that now it's coming out of your pocket. So if we're dealing with someone who is very tight financially and barely qualifying with their income and the debt to income ratio, and they're used to making, let's say, $1,000 a month or $1,100 a month in rent. And now all of a sudden, their mortgage payment is going to be $1,700 a month. We call that payment shock. And we don't have any indication to provide that the borrower has a sufficient cash reserves or savings that can help out in situations like that. We usually have these conversations with them. Like, you qualify, you're able to purchase, and you know we might be able to qualify you even with the down payment assistance and all this stuff. But from a financial point of view, this is what's going to be coming up. And we personally just want to share that with you, just to make sure that you're aware of that. Do you feel comfortable with these payments? And do you feel comfortable with it? Because you can't really find a house where the payment is going to be $1,100, especially in the area we live in right now. So that's going to be 
a massive change in their lifestyle. And you don't want people to become homeowners, but they're poor and they can't do anything else. They're just staying in the home. So that is the situation where we usually tell someone, we just do not recommend you buying right now, or at least buying whatever house that they were looking to buy. Well, that is noble of you to recommend that because it's, you know, obviously you make money on the transaction. And I think that is why you've been so successful is because you can have these hard conversations. And uh, I think you're right. Some Just because you can buy something doesn't mean that you should. And uh, there's a lot of things that go go into being a homeowner. You have to take care of the house, much less pay your your insurance and your principal and interest exactly. and taxes. You got to take care of everything. It can be as simple as literally just the AC going out in the summer. And that usually what happens. And now now what? It's going to cost you at least two to $3,000 to replace it. Do you have that money available to do for that to happen? Or you're going to be basically unable to fix the, the AC, you know? So like simple as that, you know, they're hard conversations, but they're real. And they're real, you know, that we have fiduciary duty to our clients to make sure that they are set up in the right financial situation, mm -hmm. because here's the worst thing that we can do for someone, get them excited. They became homeowners. And then six months later, they're foreclosed on yeah, that's because terrible. they can't make the payments. Right. I mean, that it does not serve anybody well at that point. Yeah. And they can, I mean, that's, that's a good point when appliances obviously do go out and depending on the age of the home, sometimes it's wise, uh, depending on the financial situation of the client and then how old the house is, they can get home warranties and things like that to protect themselves. But obviously long-term, the warranty companies are in business to make money. So long-term, you know, depending on if you, if you never had a claim, obviously the insurance company is going to win, but for some circumstances that might make sense to trade off 30 to 50 bucks a month, just in case something happens, it'll take those, uh, big losses or big expenditures off the table for the most part. But, but anyway, yeah, I, I agree with you. There are just some people that shouldn't, shouldn't buy the house. They should to rent at least in the short term. I think that's a, that's a good move. So for yep. listeners that want to get more information, maybe on their specific situation, that want help with a refinance, a purchase, or maybe to prepare themselves for uh, one of the two, what's the best way we can uh, reach you? I know you gave the website earlier, but can you give me the website, maybe a phone number as well? Yeah. So a, the website is teamfushang.com. Team, my last name, F as in Frank, O-O-S-H-A-N-G.com. My personal number, they can call me or text me at it anytime they want, 512-549-4450, 512-549-4450. The application, if someone's ready to apply right away, there's a link on my website, but they can also go to application.teamfushang.com and it will take them straight there. Okay. We'll add that in the show notes too. Thank you for that. Perfect. And as we, you know, wrap up this interview, I always uh, finish up with a rapid fire session because I'd like to know the guests that, that come on the show and the rapid fires is, is a way for myself and the listeners to know you a little, get to know you a little better. So let me ask you first, what do you do to keep your edge? How do you keep the ax sharp, so to speak? Man, I am an avid reader. There is a huge bookshelf in my office and a bigger shelf in my house. So I am always reading podcasts like yours. I always love to listen to other professionals as well, like Michael Hyatt. He has a really good uh, podcast. Todd Duncan, he has a really fantastic podcast that I like to listen to frequently. And there's Gary V, known as Gary Vaynerchuk, is a fantastic podcast. And obviously, your podcast is fantastic. I love listen, listening to all your new episodes. So you have to make sure that you are at least listening to something positive or reading something positive or constructive at least 30 minutes a day, every, every single day. I totally agree with you. So who has uh, been the most impactful on your life? Tony Robbins. We Tony met Robbins, at a Tony, sure. Tony yeah. Robbins event. We, we, we did. We did. So I, you know, very, very, very quick. So I came to the U.S., in 97, I was 17 years old. I mean, I, I did not speak a word of English, uh, Jack, as I, uh, as I have told you the story. And I literally uh, received a tape from somebody I knew at college who basically gave it to me with a copy of the, his personal power program, the journal for the program. I literally did not understand anything that was said, but I would listen to the tape over and over and over every single day. And frankly, that was kind of like the beginning of me learning English. It was listening to these tapes and these programs, and I would use the dictionary to translate 
what was written in that journal and fast forward. That's how that's how I became obviously in love with the personal development materials and stuff. But Tony Robbins for sure was the very first influence on me. Yeah, he's been very uh, impactful in my life as well. If you could recommend one book, what would it be? Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Love, love that book as well. That's, I read that book once a year since I was 19 years old. And every single time I read it, I find something new. And I wonder, like, how in the heck did I not pay attention to that all these years? And, and frankly, as you grow in your business and in your life, you change as an individual and your priorities change and your attention change as well. So depending on where you are in your life, you will find new message every time you read that book. That is very relatable to what you're going through. Yes. And by the way, that book was the uh, cause or one of the causes that we got out of the Great Depressions in the 30s because that book was released in 1936 or 1937 when the country was devastated with the Great Depression. And that book created most of the millionaires we know today. Yeah, outstanding book. I, I agree with you. I need to read it again. So thanks for the reminder. What do you do in Absolutely. your free time? So I, I love to take walks. I am a huge soccer fan, obviously, right now with the COVID-19 situation, we're being locked in the house, but I'm not, I'm taking advantage of it that I do take a walks around the uh, the block. I do love to read. So it's a great time to read when you're not working in the evening or early in the morning, watching movies with the kids in the evening. That's basically what I'm doing right now. It's first free time. Yeah, I agree. You you have to get out. And that's where I do a lot of my, the, the best thinking is uh, walking. So especially nowadays yeah. when we're all kind of asked to shelter in place. I think it's more important than ever to move. And, that, and that's part of how you can keep a good, level-headed, positive mindset is with movement. So how does Eddie Fushang want to be remembered? It's a legacy question. That I have somehow impacted someone, at least it's one person, to have a positive impact on their life. That's a successful life for me. One person was able to benefit from me or receive some sort of a positive impact from me that has affected their life in a positive way. To me, that's enough. That's life worth living. That's what it's all about is helping everyone. And I think after all this is over, I think that's what's going to resonate and bring us all closer together is that we were, your neighbor was there to help you. So um, exactly. last question, I am all about tips and tricks to shorten the time it takes to, to find true success. What's one parting tip or advice you'd like to share to our listeners? Just sit down and count your blessings. During these times, it's very tough times that we're going through right now. There is definitely a lot of fear in the air. A lot of people sometimes overlook the fact that we are still extremely lucky and blessed to be living in the greatest country on earth. Number two, count the blessing, the fact that you still have your eyesight, uh, your hearing, you're healthy. You still have your loved ones around you. They're healthy. Like sometimes we take these things for granted and situations like what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 and the stay at home rules and all that stuff, it made us realize how blessed we were uh, prior to this and w the things we took for granted. Like, for example, going to the grocery store and not finding people acting crazy and wild and emptying shelves. Like the things we used to take for granted back then, going to the grocery store, knowing that you will always find eggs right? Like the things that sometimes we never paid attention to before, now to us is a luxury, believe it or not. And it's funny to, to think about it that way, but it's truly an eye opener. The fact that you're able to just get out of the house and go whenever you want to go, wherever you want to go, that by itself, that freedom, things we used to take for granted. So I just want to remind people, just sit down for a second, count your blessings, count the things that are still going great in your life. And uh, that should absolutely because you can never be depressed if you're in a state of gratitude. If you're grateful, you can never be depressed. It's scientifically impossible. So just count your blessings and be grateful for the things you have. And you're going to elevate your mood and your vibe immediately. I agree with you. That is excellent, excellent advice um, every day and especially during these turbulent times. So thank you again for all your help with uh, you know uncovering opportunities, the change in the market as far as uh, mortgages are concerned. And I encourage listeners to reach out to Eddie and his team. He is uh, one of the leaders in the mortgage industry, and he would be happy to and grateful to, to help you in the journey, no matter if it's a refinance or a new home purchase. Give Eddie a call. Thank you, Eddie, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate it, buddy. Take care. Yeah, take care. 
That's all for this episode of Profits to Wealth. But we have more resources available to you on our website. Head over to ProfitsToWealth.com and take our questionnaire to find out how we can provide you with a tailored approach to your entrepreneurial journey. It's available exclusively on ProfitsToWealth.com. Until next time, we look forward to talking business, money, and freedom.